You're listening to the New Hope Church podcast. To learn more about what we're doing on the south side of Indianapolis, you can check us out online at becomehope.com. If you like what you're hearing here, be sure you check out one of our companion podcasts. We have a daily devotional podcast called Let's Find Out Together, as well as an apologetics podcast called Salty Saints. Let's listen in. Today's talk comes from Zach Killy. Good morning. My name's Zach. I'm one of the pastors here at New Hope. And today is our last day of Esther. I know you're super duper sad. But uh, we've had some good times. We've, uh, we've talked about a lot. Our first week, we kind of laid out and outlined a structure of Esther. And over the coming weeks after that, we sort of started breaking it down into these deeper themes that we sort of started unpacking throughout the book to see what was really buried under all that. Uh, we talked about some fun things like anger. We talked about living selflessly. Uh, we talked about debauchery. That was super fun. And today, you may be wondering, what are we going to talk about? And the answer is, we're not going to talk about anything in the book of Esther. That's a little weird. Yeah, wait, wait, wait for it, wait for it. I'm being, I'm being sneaky, see? We're going to talk about God. Because he's never in the book. His name is never mentioned in the book of Esther. It's to the point that you can like scour over it and you're not going to see the word God in Esther. You're not going to see him in there. His name doesn't pop up, right? It's gotten to the point where there are theologians, there's historians, biblical scholars that wonder if Esther should even be considered a biblical religious text, if it's actually an inspired book. They actually wonder if it should be considered more of like a historical book, a secular book. But I think they're wrong. I kind of want to break that down. I want to to kind of talk about that a little bit. I think what this really boils down to um, is that the author of Esther knows what they're doing, right? There was a very intentional mindset behind the writing of Esther, and there's a reason why God's name isn't directly mentioned in Esther. And I think it boils down to maybe this sort of thought here. Have you ever wondered... Like in the midst of a really bad situation or a really hard time or maybe just just a regular day, like where is God right now? Have you asked that? I have. I've asked that. I'm not really saying like, is he real? You know, I think when I look back on my life, like I don't know that I've ever really doubted like the existence of God. Like I, I see that in nature. I see that in the way things work. I see that he designed these things. I see that. That part's easy for me to pick up on. It's the question of like, where is he when things are hard? Like, um, I've talked about my house fire before. I've talked about that several times. It was a pivotal moment in my life. It was a big deal. It was in 2017. I watched my house and my family's business that they had had forever burn down before my eyes standing in the snow, just chilling, watching everything I own burn to the ground. And you can't help but go like, hey, where is God right now? Like, why isn't he doing anything? Where is he? What's going on? Uh, My dad had a triple bypass when he was uh, like 50. And I remember thinking about that and being like, he might not wake up from that table. Like, that might be it. And then he did, he got through the surgery, and it was like, okay, cool. And then we bury him 10 years later. And it's like, where's, where's God right now? Where, like, where are you, God? Like, right now, in this, in the middle of this, like, where are you? I don't see you. I'm not saying you're not real. I'm saying, like, where are you? That's not hard to think, right? I feel like any time I've really ever been confronted with death, death of a loved one, death of a friend, death of even, like, a pet, right? Like, It's like, where's God right now? What's this? This isn't how things are supposed to work. I think it kind of works that way on like a a worldwide scale. I remember as a kid watching uh, uh, the news one morning. I walked downstairs and my parents are standing in front of the TV and they're, they're acting weird. My mom's crying. And I look at the TV and there's an airplane sticking out of a building. And I'm like, well, that's not supposed to happen. 
And you see people jumping off of these buildings, and you see the buildings eventually collapse, and you see people digging through rubble, looking for their loved ones. And it's like, that's the first time in my life I realized, like, people are capable of hurting people on, like, a massive scale. I'd heard about it, but that's the first time I saw it. And you can't help but in the middle of that be like, hey, where's God right now? And I think when we look at the book of Esther, we see Esther and we see Mordecai dealing with some pretty crazy stuff. This is a book full of debauchery and death and murder plots and all this craziness. And under all this craziness, they have to be wondering, where's God? And I think that's what the book of Esther is all about. I think it's about diagnosing that question, like at the heart of it, at the core of it, at the structure of it. I think that's what this book is trying to answer is where's God? What's God really doing? And so one more time, just for old time's sake, can we go through the story? Can we tell it? It starts with two feasts, two feasts and the splendor of a king. You see, Israel is living under exile. They were exiled into Babylon. That has now transferred to Persia. And now we have King Xerxes, Artaxerxes, Xerxes I, Xerxes II. We're not sure which one, but he's one of them. We know that. We know that. We can pinpoint it historically based on those four dudes. It's a pretty, pretty narrowed down timeline. And he's having this big old party, two of them, in fact, and they're weeks long. They're these big, big banquets, these big celebrations. And he, in his drunken stupor, trying to show off for his buddies, wants his wife to parade around the room and show her off how beautiful she is, but she's not going to be showed off like some kind of piece of meat. And so he divorces her and he exiles her. And then he has his little pageant where he brings all the most beautiful virgins of the area. They all come into this area. They, they enter this little contest to see who's going to be the next queen of Persia. And that's where our girl Esther comes in the picture. She's, uh, she's an orphan. She's a Jew. And her parents have both died. She's now with, living with her uh, relative Mordecai. And he's a good man, right? And he tells her, hey, you should go try out for this thing. You should, you should do it. And she does. And the king is just enamored with her. So much so that it's not, it seems like it's more than beauty. It's like he's actually interested in her. He actually cares about her. And he makes her his queen. Esther becomes the queen. Now here's the deal. We got her relative Mordecai. He works over toward the uh, the gates of the kingdom, right? And one day he overhears a couple of, of these guards, these soldier types, and they're plotting a murder for the king. Now Mordecai's like, no, we can't have people dying around here. So he goes and he tells Esther, he says, hey, will you go tell the king this is what's going on? So she tells her officials, they tell the king, boom, these two guys are dealt with, they're handled, they're dead. But then the king decides to elect somebody as an advisor. And he elects a guy named Haman. Haman is elevated to a position of power. Haman is the bad guy. He is such, like, he's almost tacky. He's such a bad guy, right? Like, you see this guy, clearly not good, bad, immediately. He walks around, he's got this God complex. He thinks people should bow down before him, but here's the deal, not Mordecai. Mordecai won't bow down before Haman. Why? Well, never explicitly explains why, but we know that Mordecai is a Jew, And we know that Jews worship one God, the Most High God. And when we look at other books, like Daniel, we see them doing the same thing, that they won't bow down before people who aren't God. And so we realize that the reason Mordecai is not bowing down is because Haman isn't God, and he doesn't deserve it. And so he won't do it. And so Haman decides he's going to kill Mordecai. But not just Mordecai, he's going to kill all the Jews. And he does this by going to the king and telling him there's a group of people in your kingdom that they don't want to go along with the things that we want to do. They're causing problems. We got to get rid of these guys. And the king says, I'll do whatever, you know, go make a law. I don't care. It's cool. Here's the ring. Here's the signet. Go sign it, seal it. It's great. Well, Haman decides they're all going to die. All the Jews are going to die a year from now throughout the entire kingdom. Mordecai finds out 
about all this. He goes in the morning. He goes, starts fasting. He's wearing sackcloth. He's hiding at the gates. All the Jews start joining him, right? And then Mordecai gets this idea. He goes to Esther, and they develop a plan. Mordecai says, you're the queen, and you're the only one that's got a chance of saving this kingdom, or saving the Jews in this kingdom. You're going to have to go into the court of the king. You're going to have to tell him that you're a Jew because he hasn't known until now. And you're going to have to tell him what all's going on and save the day, even though you're probably going to die because no one's allowed to go before the king uninvited. The only thing that's going to save you is his mercy. And so Esther and Mordecai plan uh, to reverse this decree, right? Well, she does it. She goes through with it. She decides she's going to put her own neck on the line. She goes in. She goes before the king. The king shows her mercy. He says, what do you need? Because he loves her, right? And she says something interesting. She says, I want to have a banquet. I want to hold a banquet, and I'm inviting three people. I'm inviting you, me, and Haman. And the king's like, okay. So they have the banquet. They have this first banquet. And what we see during the banquet is Haman starts to get really puffed up. He starts to think, hey, the king must really like me. I must be a really big deal. And he starts telling his family, oh, yeah, I'm awesome. The king loves me, whatever. This is great. And he's, he's plotting how he's going to kill Mordecai all throughout this, right? But then Esther says something really weird, really, really weird. She says, I actually want to have a second banquet. I want to have a second banquet, and I'm still inviting just the king, just me, just Haman, and during that, she tells the king, I'm a Jew. My people are the Jews. This guy's plotting my demise and the demise of my people. We're all going to die. The king, he's furious. He's freaked out. He leaves the room. He doesn't know how to handle it. Haman starts pleading for his life. He grabs her around the waist. She's on a couch. It looks like he's trying to force himself on her. The king walks back in. He sees this going down. He immediately orders for the execution of Haman. And so, we see Haman, he's dead, he gets killed. We then see Esther and Mordecai thinking, hey, but there's still this decree. All the Jews are going to die. What are we going to do about this? So they start planning how they're going to reverse it. They go to the king. The king now trusts them. Mordecai has saved his life once. Esther has revealed that Haman has been after Mordecai this entire time. Mordecai seems like a trustworthy good guy. The king says, do whatever you got to do. Go make a law. Here's my signet ring. Sign it, whatever. It's got my blessing. So he does, right? So they counter decree to save the Jews. That's a big deal. The Jews are now saved by who? By Queen Esther and Mordecai. They save the Jewish people. We see them in tandem. It's through Esther's ability to get to the king because she's the queen and loved by him and Mordecai's counsel, right? Mordecai is elevated to power, and the book ends with two feasts and the splendor of Mordecai. Okay. Why does all of this matter? Can we pull up a point A there as well, Jim? One more. Um, here's what we see in all this. What I see when I look at this is we get to the middle of the story and things sort of flip. And what you'll notice is we've got A, B, C, D, E, F, then we do F and then work our way back to A. Reason being is this. When we look at the story of Esther, we see this theme. Everything is trending downward. It's all trending bad. It's all going terrible for the first half of the story. Randy kind of walked us through this structure already, but I want to dive in a little deeper with it. We see that even though all these people are committed to committing debauchery and evil and murder and genocide, all these awful things, it seems like they're going to reach this peak where it just all falls apart and the Jews die and Haman wins out and, and things are just bad, right? And right then, right at that moment, when Haman is elevated at this feast, right? When everything is going his way, he's at a feast, he's being honored, right? He thinks he's the hottest thing in the market. He thinks he's about to kill Mordecai. Right then, Esther 
plays the Uno reverse card, okay? Which is totally out of nowhere because you're asking, the first time I read this, the first time I read Esther, the first time anybody reads Esther, they should probably be thinking, why does she throw a second banquet? Why not just do it the first time? That's because we don't get this structure without it. (laughs) I don't even know that she knows that. But that's how she did it. That's how it worked. She plays a second banquet. They all come, and then that's the one where he dies. And what happens from there? It's all trending up. And so what I see in the midst of this story is even though God is mentioned nowhere in it, simply by looking at the structure, what do we see? We see that God is taking all the bad, and then he's going to flip it, and he's going to do good. He's in control. He's in absolute control. But I want to go a layer deeper because he is in such absolute control that we would kind of be doing him a disservice not to point this out. We're going to talk about something called a chiasm. Did we go into depth on this the first time? I didn't think so. Here's the deal. A chiasm is something you see in literature, right? And it comes from the Greek letter chi. Looks like an X. You've probably, if you've seen like Greek letters in, uh, you know, frats and sororities, you've seen C-H-I. Some people say chi, some people say chi. It's he. And it looks like the letter X. Now, the reason this is important is because when you look at the letter X, what do you see? You see two lines intersecting and they mirror each other, but they meet in the middle, right? Right? And so a chiasm is that structure laid out in literature. And so what do you see when you look at the story of Esther? Let's look at the very first thing and the very last thing, both of the A's. We see that the story starts with two feasts and the splendor of King Xerxes. He is just feeling himself. He is the best thing around it. How's it end? With two feasts and the splendor of Mordecai, the man that was there to do God's will. He is elevated. He, people are basking in his glory. Let's keep working our way in. Look at the bees. Esther becomes queen. What then? The last, the, the later bee is that Queen Esther and Mordecai saved the Jewish people. That had Esther not been the queen, they wouldn't have had the pull to save the Jewish people. See, Haman, he's elevated to power. C, Mordecai is elevated to power. D, Haman decrees to destroy the Jews. D, counter decree to save the Jews. E, Esther and Mordecai plan to reverse the decree. Esther and Mordecai plan to reverse the decree. And right in the middle, we see banquet one, banquet two, a perfect mirroring. Here is the point I'm trying to make. Your God, my God, is so sovereign, so in control on a layer that we can't even see that he can take true life, real-to-life events, things that happened in human history, and he plays them out like an artist paints a picture. That the moment two feasts are held in the honor of King Xerxes, God is laughing and saying, no, 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 no. My guy Mordecai. He is going to be seen in all his splendor for being my guy. And you're going to have two feasts in his honor. And the moment Esther becomes queen, God says, I know exactly why she'll be the queen, because she is going to save her people alongside Mordecai. And if she's not queen, it'll never happen. When Haman's elevated to power, God's laughing and saying, you're going to have this for a time, but you're going to die And then Mordecai is going to be seen for how good he is. Do you see what I'm saying? At each of these moments, God knows how he is poetically going to twist it. How he is going to mirror it. And he is going to show the bad guys just how stupid they look. And just how high God can elevate his people. Here's the point. We have to be at the end of this story to look back and be able to see that. When you're in the middle of it, you don't always see it. When you're in the middle of the problems, when you're in the middle, in the thick of all the garbage of life, you don't see God. You don't see him at work. You don't always see the good that's being worked out, right? 
But when we reflect on truth like this, we can remind ourselves and say, I don't see it, but I know he is. I don't know how this ends. I don't know how he's going to make this right, but he's going to because that's what he does. My God takes bad things and he turns them into good things. That's how we see God in the story of Esther. It's not his name. It's the way he is controlling everything behind the scenes. And he's bringing it all to the front for those he deems righteous, for those that he makes righteous. That's the first way we see God in the story of Esther. Second one, I already told you. I told you last week. We were talking about uh, sin, really. We were talking about debauchery. We were talking about what sin really does in our lives. That it makes us forget. It makes us forget the face of our Father. It makes us forget our own identity, and it makes us forget the identities of the people around us. Because see, when we're stuck in sin, we stop seeing me, myself, you, as image bearers of God. I forget who I am. When I look around, I don't see the people around me as image bearers of God. I judge them unfairly. I put things onto them that I think they should be doing that they're failing in. Or I I look at them and I think of them as less than, that I am more deserving of God's image than you are. I do things like that when I'm stuck in sin. Here's the other thing I do. I forget who God is in the first place. I forget what he's asked of me. Why am I bringing this up? What's this this have to do with God being present in Esther? God is present in Esther through his people. He's not there by name. He is there through his hands and feet, we might say, right? He's there through his representatives. He's there through his image bearers that are actually doing what they've been commanded to do. Mordecai and Esther, it never explicitly says that they're following God, but they're Jews, They know who God is. They know what he's commanded of them. And we know that they believe in him and that they follow him and they trust him because everything they're doing is what he would want. That's what we're called to do. We're called to stand up and be God to the people around us. Not him, just a little picture of him. It's kind of like this. I'm stealing this from Jason because he said it earlier this week and he even told me I could steal it, so that's cool. But like when I was a little kid, people would look at me and they would say, you look just like your dad. You look just like him. You remind me so much of your dad. Or maybe it'd be my mom. Oh my gosh, that was so your mom. I just saw, I saw that that seemed so much like what she would do in that situation. That's what we're called to be as image bearers. When people look at us, they're supposed to be like, dude, you look just like your father. That little thing you just did, that's so him. That's exactly what he would do. That's how he's present in the story. Here's actually what scripture tells us that should look like. In Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, it says, with the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do, for they're hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life God gives because they've closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. They live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But that isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you've heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Put on your new nature created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. What does holy even mean? It just means set apart. It means you don't look like the rest of the batch. It means there's something different about that one. Do you ever just meet somebody and there's just something different about them? Something just just peeks out like maybe that was God in them. I remember this one guy. I don't know if this man was a Christian, but I would bet I, I wouldn't bet. That's bad. That's bad. You know, but I bet he was though. I bet he was though. I bet he was. What I'm saying is I met this guy at a bus stop. Uh, my buddy Ben, this was back in college. My buddy Ben wanted to drive buses for Ball State. And so I went with him and we went in. And the moment I walked in, I can spot fake from a mile away. 
I can spot a fake smile, a fake laugh, fake interaction, acting happy just to seem nice. It's gross. I hate it. It bothers me so bad when people do that stuff. And this guy's like, hey guys, how you doing? And it was so genuine. And we just had this conversation with the guy. Nothing special. He never talked about Jesus. He never brought up anything like that. But we're 13 years later, and I remember that guy because the moment I walked out of there, I was like, that guy is like what Jesus would have been like. Like Jesus would have talked to people like that guy talked to people. That guy loved people. I could just see it in him. He didn't know me from anybody else, and he treated me right immediately. It was wild. I remember the first time I met Bob Anderson. Bob! Starts writing down things that we're talking about while we're talking. And I'm like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> and it's like a week later and he walks up and he's like, hey, buddy, how's that going? And I'm like, oh, my gosh, he remembered. He remembered the things we talked about. Like, he remembered me. I talked to somebody I've been working on trying to bring him to Jesus for a while now. And uh, I've tried everything. I've tried theology, I've tried apologetics, I have, I have thrown every scientific, every logical argument I can at her, okay? And nothing sticks, nothing. She is resistant to all of it. I've preached the gospel, I've done the whole nine yards, and I've been feeling so down about it because I'm like, I don't know what to do at this point. Like, do I just wipe my feet? Do I just walk away? Do I just let it go? And I've told a few friends about this because it was so weird to me. I, like, I don't know what even prompted it. But she just looked at me a couple weeks ago, and uh, the room was not exactly being respectful towards women at that moment in time. And she looked at me and she said, hey, I just want you to know that I noticed that you are respectful to women, and I want to say thanks. And that was it. I don't exactly consider myself like this chivalrous guy, and I'm like holding open doors or anything. I just like wasn't doing the thing everybody else was. That's it. And she noticed, and like I thought about that so hard, and I was like, is that what it's going to take? Maybe that thing is what it's going to take for her. To just see like that one little piece, because that's like not me. That's not who I was for most of my life. But now I'm like, well, that's what Jesus wants me to do. So that's what I'm going to do. And she saw that piece of my God through just something I wasn't even trying to do. I'm not saying that we just need to be nice to people. I'm not saying that we need to get out there and we need to preach the gospel. There is a deficit in that. We need to get out there and tell people about Jesus. We need to be zealous towards our God, for our God, right? But at the same time, sometimes the thing that's going to stick is just you treating people right, treating them like they're an image bearer of God, and in you they will see your Father. God is present all throughout Esther, whether it's him pulling the strings behind the scenes and the times that you'll never even think he's there. He's there pulling the strings. And he's there through you. God is here. Act like it. That's what I'm saying. He's present. He's never not present. And you've been called to be his representative in a cold, cruel, weird world. Get out there. And be like him to the people around you. Some of them are going to hate it, but remember, they don't hate you, they hate him. Jesus himself says that. It's not you, it's him. God is here. Act like it. I want to pray for us. Father, thank you for the example set aside in the most unlikely of places. Thank you that even when your name isn't present, you are present, Lord. Thank you for your son Jesus and the things that he taught us. Thank you that you've showed us how to behave, Lord. That we've got to set this world aside from ourselves. We've got, we got to be different in this world. We've got to stand out as your kids. And we've got to show other people that they truly are your children if they would just recognize it. That they would just accept that truth. Father, I pray today that you would be on our hearts and help us to think about the things we've looked at in your word today, that we would consider what it is you're trying to put on our heart. I pray that you would show us steps moving forward from that, that you would show us what to do with that, Lord. What does that look like in my life? It's going to look different for each one of us, Lord, but please, through your Holy Spirit, show us that. Show us what it looks like for me. 
for each one of us. And then, Lord, show us who we've got around us to hold us accountable in that because there's no lone wolf Christians out here, Lord. When we go it alone, we fall apart every single time. So please show us who we've got around us that we can have help us carry whatever it is we're trying to change, how we can be more like you today. Father, please um, just help us to do these things and help us to see you every step of the way and help us to see you when it feels like you're nowhere around. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to the New Hope Church podcast. If you would do us a favor and like or subscribe on your favorite platform, we would really appreciate it. Also, if you happen to have any questions, feel free to reach out to us at questions at becomehope.com. Have a great week and know that we are praying for you as you seek to be Jesus in every corner of your world.